welcome everybody to tonight's lecture. I'm Sarah Wasberg Johnson, Director of Exhibits and Outreach at the Hudson River Maritime Museum. Um, tonight's lecture is sponsored in part by Roundout Savings Bank. Uh, and I am very pleased that we are hosting John Harris for tonight's lecture, New York and the Illegal Slave Trade During the Civil War Era. Um, John has a PhD in American history and is currently the Boswell McDonald Chair of History at First in College. And his new book, The Last Slave Ships, was published by the Yale University Press. Um, and that is what he is basing tonight's talk on. And if you are interested in purchasing a copy, uh, it is currently <laughs> very on sale on Amazon. <laughs> so I'm going to drop the link in the chat here. Um, give me a second. And also, if you have, if you want to say hello or introduce yourself, where you're tuning in from, you can feel free to do that in the chat. You can also ask any questions you have along the way in the chat. Um, I will be moderating the chat tonight, so if it's anything pressing, I'll interrupt John if I have to. But otherwise, we're going to save questions until the end. <laughs> so, I think that is everyone, everything on my checklist. So, thanks again for joining us tonight, John. And I'm going to turn everything over to you. Okay, thank you. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Great. All right, we'll get started. Um, it is great to be with you tonight. I'm very pleased to be invited and to share this story. And I think it's an important one. I've never given a, I don't think I've ever been in my office at this time of the evening in May. And so the blazing South Carolina sun is coming in through the window and blinding, blinding me a little bit. I don't have curtains or shades or anything on the windows. So that's what's why the left side of my face will be lit up maybe for the next half hour or so. But um, let me just, uh, I guess, dig into the, um, dig into the story. So I'll share my screen here and we will, we'll get going. Okay. Okay, so this is the, the cover of my book, The Last Slave Ships, New York and the End of the Middle Passage. It's about the slave trade in New York City. And New York City is probably not the first place you think of whenever you think of an American slaving port. Probably would think about Charleston, South Carolina, or uh, maybe New Orleans, Louisiana, or um, maybe even... Um, some of the Rhode Island ports that were involved in the slave trade, especially in the colonial era and the early Republic. New York probably doesn't come to mind. It certainly didn't come to mind to me uh, when I first came across some of the traces of the slave trade. So this is um, kind of a, no, I wouldn't say brand new story, but it's um, a story that hasn't been really um, researched that much by really by anybody and I don't think it's very well well known so it's something something fresh and something different it's about slavery in the north and um, it is also a story that comes a little bit later than we might expect it this is um, an image used on the front cover of the book of New York City in the 1860s now not very many people, myself included, would think of the slave trade it being still going in the 1860s. Congress had banned it in 1808, over half a century before. So this is the story of the illegal slave trade. So in some ways, a surprisingly late and in a surprising place, New York City. So this is what the, the book is about. This is what I'm going to talk about for the next while. So a little bit of background before we get into the, the New York specific story, because what I realized when I started researching this or pulling the research threads was that it didn't make sense. The story didn't make sense if I just looked at it from a very narrow geographical perspective. So sure, the book is about New York, absolutely, but it's about the rest of what we would call the Atlantic world as well, because you can't understand the New York slave trade without understanding the bigger picture. So let me just talk a little bit about the bigger picture before we zoom in on New York. So we look here at the Atlantic world in, in 19th century, in the 1800s, 
you can see some of the major ports there. And there's a titanic struggle going on in this geographic space, uh, a titanic struggle that's going on in the early 1800s between pro-slavery forces and anti-slavery forces. So um, we have anti-slavery um, force really driving hard at the end of the 1700s and into the 1800s. And you see that from enslaved people who are rising up against their masters and mistresses in places like Haiti, which had a successful slave rebellion in the early 1800s. But you also see some of the kind of traditional power players, leading white statesmen um, in Europe, um, beginning to turn against the slave trade. And, you know, historians debate why this, why this is. Certainly, you know, enlightenment thinking has a part of a part to play. Um, some religious figures have a part to play as well. Um, but there's a, a kind of a, a maybe not a groundswell, but there's a rising tide of abolitionism in the early 1800s. And this is the moment when the United States bans the slave trade 1808. But if we look at other places, we see they're doing the same thing too. So Britain banned the slave trade 1807. Okay, the year before the United States. But you look around elsewhere, you see um, France, Spain, Portugal, uh, Brazil, all the nations that have been deeply involved in the slave trade are, are moving against it. But by the 1830s, every major slave trading nation had banned the, banned the traffic, including some African uh, nations as well. So uh, this really seems like a very positive picture, right? At least from a legislative perspective, you think maybe the slave trade completely vanquished, but it turns out not to be the case because on the other hand, you've got um, slavery is still a very powerful institution, very powerful. And it's, if you look at somewhere like Brazil in South America or the island of Cuba, what you have there is you know, vast tracts of land um, that are not yet cultivated and very powerful um, sugar economy and coffee economy that really demands enslaved laborers to, to cultivate that. And these are slave societies and the, the planters or enslavers or masters, however you want to call them, want fresh supplies of African labor through the slave trade. So their governments have banned the traffic, uh, but the slave traders, the, the, uh, the uh, slave owners in the Americas, particularly in Cuba and Brazil, are not ready to give up on the traffic. And what happens is um, you see tremendous demand in Brazil and in Cuba for enslaved people. And that produces the financial incentives for slave traders to keep slave trading. So just to give you an example in, of the money here, in the 18th century, when the slave trade was legal, slave traders, the people who would man the ships and invest in voyages, they would make typically about 10% on a slaving voyage, 10% return on their investment. By the middle of the 1800s, they're making up to 100%. And that's an incredible rate of return. And so you can see there's great demand for um, the slave trade to continue going, both from the enslavers in the Americas, the planters, and traffickers themselves who are running the ships. And that traffic is mostly going to Brazil and to Cuba. And we're talking some years, 60, 70,000 enslaved people per year crossing Atlantic Ocean in defiance of anti-slave trade laws. And um, there's not much slave trade going on to the United States at this point. And that's because a lot of um, enslaved people are being trafficked from Virginia and Maryland, the upper South states, to the expanding west, to Louisiana and Texas and further west. So we don't actually see very many captives arriving in the Americas in the, 18, in the United States in the 1820s, 30s and 40s. But what the United States is doing is trafficking a lot of people to Brazil and to Cuba. So most captives arriving in Brazil and Cuba in the 1820s and the 1830s and 1840s are arriving on American ships. So this is the picture that we have by 1850, 
a slave trade which had been abolished everywhere, but was actually still going and mostly going to Brazil and Cuba. And a lot of it was going aboard American ships. But something really important happens in 1850. And this is, uh, I tell a story in the first chapter of the book. And that was that this illegal slave trade to Brazil finally collapses. Okay, the, the, the illegal slave trade to Brazilian shores was finally suppressed in 1850. And that really mattered. Uh, it caused a massive ruction in the South Atlantic Ocean. Um, in Brazil and in West Central Africa, which you can see on the map, that was the major slave, illegal slave trading nexus. Traffickers on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean had to make a decision. Were they going to just give up on the slave trade and slide back into other kinds of shipping and mercantile pursuits? Or were they going to somehow try to continue the traffic? And it turns out that about a dozen slave traders from Brazil and from West Central Africa decided that they wanted to continue slave trading. But they couldn't do it in Brazil because the illegal slave trade there was shut down. There was only one more place where the slave trade was going, where it was still open, and that was to Cuba. But they didn't go to Cuba. Instead, they got on ships. They got on ships from Rio de Janeiro and from Cabinda and Breeze, Luanda and Benguela, which you can see in West Central Africa. And they sailed northwest all the way to New York City. Here. Now, why on earth would they come to New York City? Because New York City had not been involved in the slave trade really at all for about 100 years. And why would they come here? Well, you can actually get some hints from this watercolor image, which was painted by a German immigrant called John Bachmann in the 1860s. He came over from, from Europe about the same time these slave traders were coming from um, South America and from Africa. And what he painted here was a bustling metropolis. You can see that New York is packed. It's packed full. This is an era of massive migration, actually of Germans like Bachmann and of Irish, which is where I'm from, by the way, if you can't tell by the accent. I came a little later than everyone else. But the city is packed full and the port is booming. It's the biggest port in the Americas. There is more trade going on in New York than there is in any other port in, in the entire hemisphere. And you can see the, all the shipping there and the, some of them are sailing ships and there are even some steamers We're getting into an industrial era. In fact, some slave ships would be steam ships, which is just extraordinary. That's not something we think of, but many captives arrived in this period in Cuba aboard steamships. You can see the wharfs lining the, the two rivers there. It's a busy, booming place. It was a perfect place for these traffickers to conceal their illegal activities. Um, they're, they're concealed in a mass of human beings, and they're also concealed in this busy mercantile world. Um, there's also a very small and pretty, poli uh, pretty corrupt police um, operation in New York City as well. And bribes are going to be a big part of the illegal slave trade. And there were plenty of officials who were willing to turn the other way. And that's all laid out in the book. There's plenty of evidence for it. But maybe the key reason they came to New York was because of ships. I'd said earlier that most captives in the before 1850 had going to Brazil and going to Cuba had went on American ships. And maybe you wonder why that was. It's because the United States is really jealous of its flag. They're really determined to maintain the sovereignty of the American flag at sea. They would not allow any other nation to interfere with American ships. And at the same time, they weren't very concerned about suppressing the slave trade that took place on American ships. So you've got two things working there. Um, the United States doesn't care too much about suppressing the slave trade if it's going to other countries, right? So it's aboard American ships, but if it goes to Brazil and to Cuba, the United States isn't too concerned. But they are at the same time very concerned that Britain especially 
might try to intercept American ships and in their view, violate the sovereignty of the American flag. They wouldn't allow it. That left an amazing opening as far as the slave traders were concerned to buy up American ships, fly the American flag, and they don't have to worry about being harassed by the United States Navy because they weren't too interested. And they didn't have to worry too much about the British who were interested in suppressing the slave trade because the American government would keep the British at arm's length. This is why they come to New York. This is a great place to buy ships. And that's exactly what they did. They bought hundreds of ships in the 1850s and 1860s, usually secondhand vessels. Here is um, another illustration of New York. It's uh, um, kind of the peninsula turned 90 degrees, right? Um, so what you were just looking at, but turned 90 degrees. And what, what I did here was I used a map from the time period, the 1850s, and I went and looked at some city directories from New York. And I knew the names of the slave traders, and I can elaborate on that if you like, how did I find out who the slave traders were? But I, I, I knew their names, and then I looked them up on city directories, and I uh, plugged them into this map, and this way I could tell where they operated from. So this is a map of the illegal slave trading fraternity, <laughs> America's last slave traders. Here they are on this map in, in lower Manhattan. And you know, how did they end up in city directories? Would they not have tried to conceal what they were doing? Well, they did try to conceal what they were doing for sure. They didn't um, um, advertise it, um, but they were, um, I don't know how you would express it in modern day terms, shell companies maybe, I'm not sure. They, they had, um, they pretended to be people they weren't. They pretended to have legitimate mercantile interests, right? So many of them um, claimed to be importers of wine from Portugal, things like that. So they bought up slave ships. They bought up ships for the slave trade, but they said, you know, we're just buying up ships and we're going to send them out to sea to go to Portugal to get some wine. So they had these sort of uh, businesses that did a little bit of business, but really their main concerns were um, slave trading. But at any rate, they ended up. Um, in the city directories, and that's how we can tell where they were. I just want to draw your attention to one group on the bottom left, Maya Ferreira, Cunha Hayes, and Figanier. This was the single most prolific um, slave trading firm in, um, in this period, and one of the most prolific in American history. Maya Ferreira, Cunha Hayes, and Figanier. Let me tell you a little bit about them, and I'll focus um, really on um, Maya Ferreira. Maya Ferreira. Here is an image of Maya Ferreira on the left. This was Amer one of America's last slave traders. One of America's last slave traders. And he was born in Angola in West Central Africa. He was African. Uh, Angola was a Portuguese colony, and he was of Portuguese descent. He was, um, had close connections with uh, Brazil. He went to Brazil as a child, got his education there. He came back to Angola. He worked um, as a government official in Angola for the, um, the Portuguese government. And um, he seems to have been involved in the slave trade um, in, the, in the 1840s, just before the Brazilian slave trade crashed. And so he's one of those ones who had to make that decision, right? Am I going to just sort of get out or am I going to try to continue? And he tried to continue and he got on a ship in 1852 and sailed for New York City. He is the first slave trader out of this group who arrived in New York City. And he very quickly met um, a, a woman called Margaret Butler, and she is on the right here. And um, she was the daughter of a wealthy New York physician. And um, they got married in a um, Catholic church in downtown in New York City. And they lived together in some style. I found the letters between Maya Ferreira and his wife, Margaret, um, last summer, just before the book 
was about to come out and I had a panic attack because I found this great stash of letters that I had to write up and get into the into the book. Um, but they uh, they're in Portugal and I found them. Um, they're all digitized now, so I was able to find them online and I read them very carefully. And it's from principally from Maya Ferreira to his wife. And you can see in their correspondence that they're living in some style in Lower Manhattan. They're not hiding away. I mean, again, they're not publicizing what they're doing, but they're living in some style. They're entertaining with champagne and caviar. They're going to the opera. Maya Ferreira is off slave trading and he's going to Africa. He's spending a lot of time in Cuba and um, he's sending um, expensive gifts back to his wife. And these are really disturbing records to, to read because he's they're not entirely explicit about what they're doing, but um, I can read between the lines and see what he's what he's up to. And at the same time, he's, you know, he's talking about how much he loves his wife and kiss the children for me and all of this kind of stuff. It's sort of grim kind of um, research um, to do. But these are we're looking at the really some of the last American slave traders. Now, I, I know you're a maritime uh, museum and you want to see some ships, so I'll give, I'll give you some, some boats. <laughs> and here are some of them. Um, this is called the Melodon. It was a, a New York vessel that left out of New York in 1854. It went to West Central Africa and it was, um, it was intercepted by the British in this case. And um, this, in this case, the American um, government uh, got pretty upset with the British for, for intercepting the vessel. They didn't typically intercept American ships. There's a bit of a diplomatic spat after this one. Um, but it is why we have this great water, watercolor illustration of the vessel. This was painted by a royal, an Englishman, a Royal Navy officer um, who is uh, showing off this captured slave ship. And um, the British captured it and um, their seamen all they got paid for this. They got bounties based on captures, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on. But this is um, this is a New York slave ship. Most of the slave ships in this period are they're not built specifically for the traffic. They they typically are you know five to ten years old. They've done other things um, before they're snapped up by the slave traders. Um, I'll elaborate a little bit more. You know, one of the things that's distinctive about this period of the slave trade, and remember the slave trade has gone on for three and a half centuries at this point, but in this final period, the ships are bigger, the ships are faster, the ships are carrying more captives than ever before. On some of these ships, there are over 1,000 men, women, and children. 1,000 men, women, and children. And I mentioned earlier that some of them are steamships. Actually, here is one steamship. This is the only image that we have of a slave ship that was a steamship. And this is called the Cicerone. And it was Spanish made. And uh, it's flying the Spanish flags. You can see it's got a, this in the steamship equipment there and some of the masts too. So we're in this kind of um, hybrid era of sail and uh, moving to steam. And again, I mean, it's it, it kind of took me by surprise. When we think of the slave trade, we do not think of enslaved people on steamships, but that's how late this traffic was. Here is the uh, plan of the Isla de Cuba in 1859. This is one of the slave ships from New York. And again, it was captured by the British and the British officer in this case, um, he illustrated what he found. So let's take a look at this. So um, I think this ship was actually captured before enslaved people embarked. It was captured by the British on the African coast before the slave ships had gotten board. Um, but this is so this is what he found, and he found a whole bunch of um, barrels, and those barrels would have contained. Uh, water, and some of them would have contained rice. But one of the interesting things in this period is, so if you look back in the slave trade, it's very, very common for slave ships to turn up on the African coast and 
they buy not only human beings, but they buy food uh, and they get water as well. They buy, they get provisions for the middle passage, right? The awful voyage to the Americas. Um, and they can do that because um, there is no real pressure. And often the negotiations on the coast take a long time anyway. Some of these slave ships are staying on the African coast for, for a year. But in the period that I'm researching, it's very different because the British are on the coast trying to intercept these vessels and there's a lot of pressure on the slave ships. So the slave ships are trying to you know, ride into the African coast, force the captives aboard in six to eight hours and get back out to sea again. And there's no time. There's no time to barter for provisions and things like that. So they actually bring them from New York and occasionally from other ports as well. So what that then means is, well, a few things. One is that you've got a whole bunch of other American merchants in New York who are actually indirectly, or you might say directly involved in the slave trade as well by provisioning these ships. And you also have captives who are eating food that they are not familiar with, which is something that is distinctive in this period of the trade. Uh, the four C's you see in the middle there, they're coppers, they're, um, those are where the, the food is cooked. And their final thing to point out is there are a lot of planks, little lumber here. And the lumber is um, just loose at this point. Um, but if the ship had not been intercepted, what would have happened would have been a carpenter who would have been brought out on the slave ship and the carpenter would have built what was called at the time a slave deck. So you've got the main deck of the ship and then underneath it, you've got the hold. And in between those two, the slave deck would be constructed. And it was just a temporary um, deck on which um, enslaved people would have been forced to lie um, for most of the voyage in just terrible conditions. Um, so why was it only made when they approached the African coast? Well, it was because they didn't want to be too explicit about what they were doing um, when they were in the United States, right? So they, they built it when they neared their African destination. So that's why we see a lot of lumber. And of course, the British, these became telltale signs um, of um, the slave trade. So the slave trade in this period, we don't see shackles. We don't see shackles. Um, that's actually because they're... Um, another terrible element of this trade is that most of the captives in this period are children. And um, the thinking of the slave traders is that they do not need to be shackled because they are not a threat. And also it would be a telltale sign this was a slave trading voyage. So we don't see the most explicit signs of a slaving voyage on terms of the equipment, but it's very clear what's going on just by looking at a ship like this. And this voyage actually... Um, the ship um, had carried out three separate voyages. So let me just pull back a little bit again and, and, and show you what's, what's going on here. Um, this is a map from the book and it's illustrating a big picture of, of where the ships are leaving from and where they're going. So most of them are coming from New York City. It's not the only American port involved in the slave trade, but it is by far the most important. It is where those uh, Brazilians and West Central Africans and some Portuguese uh, first go in the United States. And after that, in subsequent years, they branch out. They branch out to Boston and to Charleston, to New Orleans. They branch out over time, but primarily that their base is New York. And so ships are leaving all those ports, but primarily New York. Some of them go to have uh, to Cuba, first of all, and this is where the voyage is going to end up right at the end and um, where the captives are going to be brought. And so sometimes the ship will go to Cuba to make arrangements, but often the ship will go directly from New York and um, head east across the Atlantic Ocean, following the Gulf Stream, following the Canary Current down to the African coast, most of them ending up in West Central Africa. Of course, these are steamships, or these are, the vast majority are sailing ships, so they have to follow the ocean currents and the, um, and the wind patterns. So they're going to West Central Africa, which had historically produced 
the most captives of any part of Africa and certainly did so in this era. And then there is the voyage to the Americas. And this is another map from the book. The vast majority of captives are leaving from West Central Africa. Um, I can certainly go into more detail about the African side of the trade if you, if you would like. Um, I said most, most captives are, are children in this period. Most are coming from fairly close to the coast. Um, this region of, West, of Africa, West Central Africa, there are many linguistic groups there, but there, there, um, there are many different languages there, but um, they come under one sort of umbrella um, linguistically. So I think we can say with some certainty that captives, although they were very likely coming from different parts of the coast, they would have been able to communicate with one another during the Middle Passage. What happened to the captives? Well, they endured a, a terrible Middle Passage. Um, the Middle Passage um, was deadly, around about uh, you know 15% or so died during the Middle Passage. This varied depend from ship to ship. Uh, the big issue was whether disease was present early in the voyage. And if disease was present early in the voyage, then it would rip through the um, the uh, the vessel over um, you know often a five to six week period. That's often how long these voyages took. Um, the Middle Passage was brutal. It was it was deadly. It was um, traumatic. Uh, mostly children. They don't know where they're going. Um, it is dark. It is hot. The opportunity for um, fighting back and overcoming the slave traders on the ship are, are pretty. Um, pretty poor. Um, the ship is pretty well um, armed and defended. And it's a, the number one priority really of the, the crew is to prevent being overthrown. It's a violent, um, deadly environment. I should note that um, a significant number of captives were intercepted. And you can see that strange little tail that's going down um, in the middle of the map in saying intercepted over 31,000 people. These are people who are in, these are ships that are intercepted by the British, um, ships that are intercepted by the British. And um, that's a whole other story. Um, that's a big and important story. What happened to those captives? And maybe I'll, I'll just leave it there. If you, if you want to know more about that, <laughs> I invite the questions. Um, they're a very interesting story. Um, but the vast majority of captives do survive the voyage and end up in the Americas. Some go to Brazil, not very many. Some go to the United States. And this is where you may have heard in the news over the past year or two that um, there are two vessels that bring captives to, one is called the Wanderer and it goes to Georgia and uh, Jekyll Island. And the other is, was the Clotilda and it brought captives to Mobile, Alabama, Mobile River. And it was the last slave ship to arrive in the United States. And it arrived in 1860. And the reason why I bring that one up is because the wreck of that vessel was, has just been found. It's just been discovered um, maybe about a year ago. And uh, there's a big debate now about whether it should be raised up and put in a museum, maybe like your own or, or not. Um, but the vast majority of captives ended up in Cuba. And I, I think, you know, this might be one of the reasons why this story is not very well known. I think if 164,000 captives had arrived on American shores, uh, maybe we would <laughs> know a lot more about this story than we do. But these American slave ships, and there are about 500 of them in the 1850s and 1860s, bring the vast majority of their captives to the island of Cuba. And, um, you know, Cuba is the largest island in the Caribbean. Uh, there are endless coastlines and great opportunities for smuggling captives um, ashore. And the, um, um, the political figures there are um, deeply corrupt and easily bribed as well. So that is where most captives go when they're working in the, in the sugar fields of, of Cuba. Um, I just wanted to bring up a few more 
details and I'm not going into too much depth. I'll, I'll leave you to pursue these things if you like. These are things that I find interesting and I think are important. This You might wonder, how, how did the money work? Who invested these voyages and how did it, how did they operate um, from a financial perspective? Um, the, the key thing about this, and it's what I do in the second chapter of the book, is I follow the money. And the key point here is that this was an era of tremendous cooperation between slave traders in different parts of the Atlantic world. So normally, hundreds of years before, um, you know, a slave ship, you'd get the money together in, say, Newport, Rhode Island. So half a dozen slave traders get together, put the money together, finance the voyage, and off they'd go to Africa. In this period, there's a much more um, collaborative uh, international um, financial structure. Um, so let's take a look here. So this is one of the voyages from New York, 1858. This is the Heidi. And you can see that there are a series of people who are putting money into the voyage. And um, you can see how much they put in. And so the first one is Julian Zulueta. And the second is Jose Pla. They were both big time sugar planters in Cuba and large um, enslavers, they own a lot of human beings. And then you see these four from New York and Lima Viana and so on. And they are like Maya Ferreira. They're coming from Brazil, Portugal, West Central Africa. They're immigrants to the United States of, um, they might say Lusophone, they're Portuguese speaking. So what we're having here is, you know, investment in Cuba, investment in New York, and then here's the investment um, on the African side, on the African side. So there are investors on the African coast. And again, I don't want to get into too much detail here, but you can see the names on the, the left column there. And these are people kind of like Maya Ferrer, Maya Ferrer's associates back in West Central Africa. Um, and so many of them are African born, some of them are Brazilian, but they're based in Africa. The second column is very grim. It is the marks. That means the, um, the, the brands that were stamped into the, um, the bodies, usually the, the chest or the back of the captives. Um, and then the consignees are, those are Spanish names. These are Cubans. Um, so that one voyage, you can see investment in New York, investment in Cuba, and investment in Africa. And this, these are the three corners of the, of the triangle, this, this triangular trade in the 1850s and 1860s. So traffickers at this period are, they're facing pressure from abolitionists. But one of the ways they're fighting back is to, is to kind of work together and lock each other into a um, system of mutual support. Um, and it, it, it works for them for a long time. But now we can get to the happier stuff, <laughs> which is, you know, people who, who fought back and then eventually beat this thing. Um, and uh, I have a chapter in the book devoted to spies. And this was really the most fun in, in part of uh, researching the book, a spy. So... There was a spy in New York City, and his name was Emilio Sanchez. And he was born in Cuba, he, but he lived in New York. He was an immigrant to New York City, and he was a merchant. And he hated the slave traders in New York. And um, I'm not going to get into all the details why, but um, he hated them. <laughs> and he fought them. And the way he fought them was to work for the British government. The British government, we said, were dedicated to suppressing the trade, although they were having some trouble because the United States wouldn't play ball with them. So the British government paid this guy, Emilio Sanchez, to spy on the slave trade in New York. And that's what, exactly what he did for three and a half years. And I could believe it when I find his letters. There are hundreds of letters written by this guy to the British government um, just saying, hey, there's a slave ship. This is what its name is. And well, you can see it actually right in front of you. This is one of his uh, writings. Memorandum of uh, slavers reported. 
And here he gives the name of the slave ship in the top left, Rosita, alias Esperanza. The rig is a bark, tons. Um, is it 980? It's large. Uh, under the Mexican flag, port of clearance, New York City, January and 1857. And he says the destination is, uh, yeah, I think it's in um, it's Latin America. And then he makes remarks. And in the remarks, he goes on to describe who actually owns this ship and where it's sailing to, a little bit about its history. And so he really gives the British government exactly what they want. And he is the single biggest, uh, or single most important um, anti-slave trade figure, I would say, in this period this in the United States, aside from Abraham Lincoln, at least when it comes to the slave trade. He's an unknown character, but of huge importance. Um, and let me tell you why. Because all this information got funneled to the British consul in New York. And the British consul wrapped it all up. Every three days, he'd wrap it up and send it to his masters back in, in London, right? the British government. And they would read it over in London, and then they would send it out to the British Navy on the African coast. And it would get to these British officers. Do you remember the, the British officer who you know, took the sketches and the watercolors? Is those same guys. They were receiving Emilio Sanchez's information. And one of the things that Sanchez did was not just identify like which ship is coming and what its name was and what rigging it was and like identifying which vessel, he was also giving them these, this background. The background would say things like, you know, this vessel is coming under the American flag, but it's not owned by an American citizen. It's owned by somebody who is Portuguese. And that meant that it wasn't actually entitled to fly the American flag. It's only an American citizen who could buy a ship and have it entitled to American flag. And so the British used this to intercept vessels like the two that you saw and they were doing that on the basis of Emilio Sanchez's intelligence. So this is a sort of vast um, you know, ring of information that spins its way out from lower Manhattan all the way to the African coast. And I estimate in the book that dozens of ships were intercepted on Sanchez's information, dozens of slave ships, and that 20,000 captives avoided the Middle Passage because of his intelligence. So in my view, that makes him one of the most significant <laughs> abolitionists in American history. Uh, I wrote a, an article for Smithsonian Magazine a couple of months ago, making the point, trying to bring this guy to light. So this guy's name is Emilio Sanchez. Um, and uh, I'll just note that um, his grandson was also called Emilio Sanchez. And this is his a photograph of the grandson. Unfortunately, I don't have an uh, image of the, the real Emilio Sanchez, but here's his grandson. And I only point him out because he's a famous um, Cuban-American uh, visual artist. And you can see here his name on the uh, forever stamp. And this is just happening right now. <laughs> you may soon see a uh, stamp uh, in the post office or on your mail of Emilio Sanchez. And the guy who, who this, this is the, 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 um, the grandson of one of the great um, anti-slavery activists in American history. Although I'm not even sure that this Emilio Sanchez knew that his grandfather was a spy because um, none of the descendants that I've spoken to know a thing about this. And I think that he may have taken his uh, secret to the grave. So I'm getting close to the end here, and um, the slave trade comes to an end too. And uh, it wasn't Emilio Sanchez who brought the slave trade to an end. Um, he, made a, he made a dent in it, but he wasn't able to stop the traffic. Uh, what really needed to happen and what did happen was political change in the United States. And that happened with the election of Abraham Lincoln. You know, throughout the 1850s and the early 1860s, um, the United States, many in the US who held political power were just not simply not really that interested in suppressing the slave trade. And these were democratic administrations. Um, James Buchanan was president. And, uh, you know, I make the argument in the book that they just, they were more interested in, in actually blaming Cuba for the slave trade than they were in kind of looking um, at themselves and part, big part of that was because 
They wanted to actually take Cuba into the United States uh, as a new state. And so they had a vested interest in pointing the finger at Cuba and not at kind of investigating their own role in the traffic. But all of that changed with the election of uh, Republican President um, Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln was uh, you know, famously anti-slavery. There's a big debate amongst historians about just how anti-slavery he was, but certainly when it came to the illegal slave trade, Lincoln was committed to ending that. And it's what he did. So when he comes to power in um, 1861, he, after a few months, makes some serious, serious moves against the traffic. One thing he does is he appoints new officials in New York. He clears out the corrupt officials who are taking bribes, put new people in. Secondly, he signed a, well, he initiated a treaty with the British government that allowed the British Navy to intercept American ships for the first time. This was a major development and, um, and it was a real problem for slave traders because at that point they had no flag that could protect them. And then finally, Lincoln refused to commute the death sentence for Nathaniel Gordon. That's what we're looking at right now. Nathaniel Gordon was a slave trader from Maine and he operated out of New York. He made at least three successful slave trading voyages in the 1850s. But in 1860, he was caught. He was caught and he was brought back to the US and he was put on trial. And it was a difficult trial, but in the end, he was convicted. And the penalty under one of the American anti slave trade laws was death, execution. And no one, no one had been executed for slave trading in American history. Uh, but Nathaniel Gordon was set to be executed. And many New Yorkers, where the slave trade was based, of course, thought that this was way too harsh. And they appealed. 10,000 New Yorkers wrote to Abraham Lincoln saying, you need to commute the sentence. This is too much. Even Gordon's wife, um, she attempted to get to the White House and she wrote to Lincoln and she said, you know, this is, this is not fair in her view. And um, Lincoln was under a lot of pressure to commute the death sentence, but he refused to do so. And on February 21st, 1862, uh, Gordon was led out from his cell in the Tombs Jail, the city jail in New York. He had tried to kill himself the night before by drinking poison. He had failed. Uh, so he was groggy, but he was conscious and he was brought out and um, he was hanged from his neck until he was dead. And he was the first and last slave trader to be executed under American law. And that was, as the New York Herald put it at the time, the thunderclap. At that moment, the slave traders who had swept into New York in the early 1850s swept back out again. They left, they left quickly. Maya Ferreira was gone, Cunha Hayes was gone. They all left once more. And the slave trade from New York came to an end. There was one more voyage that left in the winter of 1862. And that was the last American slave ship that left from New York City. Um, and it, it too was captured um, in 1863, and that was it. So I will just wrap up by um, finishing on a, a little biographical note. On, on the left, we have one of Maya Ferreira's slave trading associates, Cunha Hayes. And um, I, you know, it's difficult to find images of some of these people and I struggled to find one of him, but I did find his passport application. He swept out of New York, as I mentioned, in the early 1860s, but he returned in 1869 and here he is applying for a passport. This is one of the great, um, or I mean, I mean great in the, in the terrible sense, I mean, large scale um, human rights uh, abusers in American history, I would say. And he is coming back into the United States uh, with his family. And he uh, became an American citizen, got an American passport. 
and nothing uh, untoward became came his way. And, um, you know, this is in some ways mirroring what happened to Confederates after the Civil War at the same time period. There was um, a forgiveness or a blind eye was turned. And so these slave traders, and I'm sort of sorry to say, never really got their comeuppance at all. Um, at least now we're sort of bringing their crimes to light, though. And on the right is Alawale Kosola. And I open the book with his story and I end the book with his story as well. He was uh, aboard the Clotilda, that voyage that arrived in the um, Mobile River in the 1860s. So one of those unusual vessels that ended up in, in the United States. And he came as, uh, as a teenager and he was captured in a raid in the interior of West Africa. And he ended up in Alabama in um, 1865. He uh, was able to secure his, his freedom um, at the end of the Civil War, at this post-war amendments banning slavery and he became an American citizen. He and many of the captives aboard his vessel, the Clotilda, now they were freed, bought land from their former enslaver who had bought them off the slave ship in 1860. And they bought their land and they set up a town and they called their town Africa Town in memory of their homes back in Africa. And they were never able to get back to Africa. They couldn't afford it. Um, but this is some uh, a community that endured the slave trade. And it is um, somebody who we actually know quite a bit about. And that is thanks to a series of interviews that were done by the anthropologist and folklorist Zora Neale Hurston, I'm sure you've heard of. Heard of. Um, she in the 1930s uh, went to Alabama and interviewed him. And he talked a lot about the illegal slave trade and his own experiences. So he is a rare um, voice of somebody who endured this traffic and um, endured. And at the same time, it is a reminder that uh, there were people who lived during, who were still alive during the Great Depression, who had been victims of the American slave trade, which is a, a chilling and uh, stunning uh, way to, to think about it. So this traffic went on for a long time and large scale. So I think I'll leave it there and um, pass it off to Sarah. And uh, I welcome uh, whatever questions you may have. Thank you so much, John. That was amazing. Um, so we have a couple of questions, I think. And everybody, if you have more questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. I know I have a question that I'm just going to ask in a minute here. <laughs> um, so you teased us a little bit with the, I'm, I'm not going to tell that story, but so someone asked, Carla asked, uh, what did happen to the intercepted, intercepted captives, which Debbie is also curious about. And you said um, Emilio Rodriguez prevented 20,000, 22,000 people from being, um, being brought to the Americas as enslaved people. What, what happened to them? Yeah, okay. Well, okay, we'll start with the um, intercepted Africans intercepted Africans, and I'm using that term deliberately. The, the British at the time used the term liberated Africans, liberated Africans. Um, I will leave it to you to decide whether we should use that term liberated or intercepted, because th this is what happened. Um, the British intercepted these ships and um, tens of thousands of people in the 19th century, and they were freed from the slave ships but they, and they were often taken to one of two places, Sierra Leone on the African coast, which was a, a British colony, or an island in the South Atlantic called St. Helena. And in the period I'm looking at was mostly St. Helena. And what happened next is kind of saddening, maybe maddening. There was a, uh, this was the moment in which the, the British had abolished slavery throughout the British empire but they still wanted people of African descent to grow sugar in the Caribbean. And so ships came to places like St. Helena, uh, 
and carried off these intercepted Africans and took them to the Caribbean, where they entered into uh, what the British called indentures, basically um, work contracts, although they had no, they couldn't negotiate the contract. Contracts were imposed upon them for three to five years and they toiled in the Caribbean sugar fields uh, in conditions that probably weren't much unlike what was going on in Cuba for enslaved people. Now, there's, if you lived and survived, there would be freedom at the end of that. Um, but this is not sort of you're free, you can go you know, back to where you came from in your homeland. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of traumas involved in this as well. So that's what the, the British did. And actually the, Portu the, uh, the United States, when they did intercept vessels, which is pretty rare, they did a similar kind of thing. Um, so I track that in, in, in the book and look at some cases of intercepted Africans. Yeah. So that, and then the, the Emilio Sanchez question, um, what became of them? Well, they became, they were funneled into this sort of liberated African. So this is why I use the term, you know, spared the uh, middle passage, uh, you know, well, enslavement during the middle passage. Uh, because they, it was no panacea, you know, being intercepted by the British. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I don't know that if anybody else has any questions, you can feel free to drop in the chat, or if you'd like to ask yours verbally, you can. Um, I'm going to make my little question slash comment, which is I was astonished to learn that steamships were used in the slave trade. Um, although, of course, when you stop and think about it, it makes sense. Uh, but I've also, I'm not sure if you know this, but there is some evidence that steamboats were used in the Underground Railroad in, mm -hmm. in the Hudson Valley. So that was a very interesting juxtaposition in my mind that, you know, we talk a lot about steamboats at the Maritime Museum. <laughs> and those are two instances which don't get mentioned very often in steamboat yeah. history, so. Yeah, I, you know, I think that people who want to continue this slave slave trade or, or even slavery and those who want to end it are using the the best tools and technologies at their disposal and yeah i write about this a little bit in the book that there is kind of a technology war going on you know the the british navy are using steamships so the slave traders use steamships i mean of course they're ch they're chasing each other on, on the african coast you see the slave traders are using the telegraph. Again, not something you think about with slave trading, but they're using the telegraph. And so are um, you know, the British are using that as well. So the, the, the tools of the, the modern world are put to work um, to continue the slave trade and to suppress it. Yeah. So we have another question. Um, Miriam wants to know a little bit more about why children were targeted specifically and then what they ended up doing or you know what kinds of work they were forced into um, in the Americas of why children would be desirable as enslaved people. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one that historians have spent some time trying to figure out. Um, I think the answer is that slave traders wanted to traffic children um, as opposed to adults. And because they felt that children were more manageable on the slave ship in an era when they couldn't travel with shackles. So that is a very grim answer, but I think that is the right one. And it's the way that slave traders really thought. I mean, they did not think of in terms of humanity, of course. Um, um, and this, this is the one that I think makes most sense. I mean, we see it, whichever part of the African coast you look at, you see the same pattern. So it's not something I don't think that is to do with, um, you know, some kind of societal or cultural issue in Africa or the internal dynamics of Africa in this case, I think it is to do with the demand from, from traffickers. And I, yeah. I don't actually think it is to do with the um, enslavers in the Americas because they typically want 
adults because they can go straight to work. They're also thinking cold in cold uh, financial terms as well. They don't want to re you know feed children until you know they want them to go right to work. So it was a very grim um, to topic, but I think that the right answer is it's what the slave traders think that uh, the transportation will be easiest from their perspective with children. And of course, you, you mean, there's some examples, you have pregnant women on slave ships that, you know, I see in this period, you have babies born on slave ships. It's really, really pretty grim. Thank you for clarifying. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for John? Um, I'm just going to ask a little bit of a clarifying question. So most of the people um, who were enslaved and who were brought to the Americas, were most of them being enslaved on sugar plantations specifically, or, or what was the main driver of the slave trade? Yeah, it, it was sugar. It was sugar. And, um, you know, we're Americans, most of us, I'm sure, you know, we, we might, we think of 19th century, think of the side, we think of cotton. And that, 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 that makes sense for the United States. But for most of the Americas, it's sugar. Sugar is the driver and certainly the driver in Cuba. By 1830, Cuba produces more sugar than anywhere else in the world. And the sugar economy is roaring and of course, the sugar is being consumed by Americans and by Britons and other people in, in Europe. So, you know, there's it's, it's in some ways the sugar addiction, uh, which in some ways is driving this slave trade, you know, me indirectly, but it's, it's driving the slave trade. And of course, you've got the irony there that the British, on the one hand, are trying to suppress the slave trade. On the other hand, it is Britain's who are eating up all of that sugar that helps drive the traffic as well. So, you know, it's, um, it's a complicated and contradictory narrative. What I really tried to do in the book was to try to just to lay it out as clearly as possible uh, while still um, being, um, you know, accurate in terms of all of these complexities. Um, okay, so Virginia asks, who was capturing these individuals in Africa so they could be brought to the slave ship? Yeah, great question. So in, in general, and this is, this is true throughout the history of the slave trade, um, outsiders, uh, you know, Europeans, Americans, others, um, are not able to get very far into the interior of Africa. Africa is a pretty formidable place and Africans are pretty powerful. And um, so Europeans and others typically stay on the coast. So um, what, how enslavement takes place is usually different African nations warring against one another. Um, and those wars produce prisoners of war who are often sent to the coast to be sold. And I should point out, that this is an era when European nations are going to war with one another too. So, and um, we should think about these African nations as, as really distinct nations, different cultures, different languages, these are, um, and, and fighting just as Europeans are doing. But those conflicts produce captives and they're sent down to the coast. Sometimes um, there's judicial enslavement. So say someone um, is co committed a particularly heinous crime, you know, rape or murder or, or maybe someone can't pay a debt. Um, and finally, you would have to look at uh, kidnapping as well. And that's what happened to Casola, whose picture I just uh, showed you. He was, his town was surrounded and most of the town's people were um, sent down to the coast. So this is a, a rival um, town had invaded um, there. So those are some of the, the main the main ways that people became en enslaved in Africa and sent on to the coast. So then I'm going to ask the follow-up question of how did children get transported then? When do we know? Well, I think that the kidnapping is, um, 
is more prevalent in this period when there are more children. And um, I think overall, the slave trade is actually in, in decline in the 1850s and 1860s because the slave trade to Brazil had been closed, which was so huge. So uh, I think what we see more often in the 1850s and 1860s is kidnapping of sort of individual children, really terrifying prospect when you think about it. Um, you know, isolated children being snatched up and sent to the coast. Um, there's some you know, British Navy officers sometimes speculate that there was a famine in the land that maybe um, children, you know, mouths couldn't be fed and uh, kids would be sent to the coast. Although, uh, you know, that, that's sort of hard to say because the British weren't really in, in those communities and able to see what was really going on. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that, the, the, you know, the slave trade in this period and in previous eras is, um, you know, it's a multinational endeavor with African slave traders involved, uh, North American slave traders involved, uh, Cuban, Brazilian, you know, it's sort of, um, you might say the dregs of the world are, are kind of participating in this together. Okay. We have now is the chance to ask your last questions. If anybody else has any, I'm going to ask a question so that people have time to formulate their final question, which is um, how did you find all of these records? Like, was there some single archival treasure trove that you stumbled upon or was it a lot of ferreting out tiny bits of information here and there? <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of digging and there was a lot of, uh, oh, am I really going to be able to do this justice? And then, you know, I, you know, I think research is a mixture of so intuition and, and luck. And, you know, so, for example, the Emilio Sanchez, all of his spy letters, which is really in some ways the basis of the book, because he's just got all the material or much of it that I need. I find that by ju just by knowing that the British really wanted to suppress the slave trade. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to see what the British consul in New York had to say about what was going on right under his nose. When I did that, you know, the archivist came out and the file, which I expected to be like that, was like this, like, oh, what's in here? And, you know, then the spy letters uh, were there. So it was a mixture of intuition and, and kind of getting, getting lucky as well. And um, so those were some, you know, rich sources. But I, I mean, I found a Masonic Lodge in New York, and that's where many of these slave traders were operating. I went up to their archive and I did not tell the archivist what I was looking at because that Masonic Lodge is still active. <laughs> and, I, and I said, if, if I tell him what I'm really doing, he's not going to let me in. So I just said I was interested in this person and his sort of business history. And then lo and behold, when I looked at the, you know, the, the, um, the list of members of this Masonic Lodge, it was a who's who of the traffickers in New York. So, you know, again, a mixture of ferreting out and kind of some intuition and then you can get lucky. A lot of misses as well, but um, a lot of nice hits too. And I went to Cuba and I went to London and I went to Madrid in Spain, went all over the US. I, you know, as I, I think I opened with this, you know, I said, this, this is not, I mean, it's a New York story, but you, I could not, if I just focused on New York and didn't think about the external connections, I would not have been able to write the book that I wrote. So, or tell the story the way it should be told, I think. Well, I think just about any New York story is never just about New York. <laughs> that's true, that's true. <laughs> um, okay, so Carla has a comment and a question. She says, I'm amazed a non-Mason got into the Masonic <laughs> archive. Yeah. Um, and then she also asks, do you read Portuguese and Spanish? Yeah, well, I read. I, that's a, I'm glad you asked it that way because I read Portuguese and Spanish. Yes, <laughs> I can read them, um, not speak them too well, but I can read them. And yeah, the Masonic Lodge, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing. I mean, I was there to go to the New York Public Library, which turned out to be a bit of a bust, actually. Um, but then I, on a whim, I went to this other place and uh, um, they they let me in. I was just sort of shooting from the hip. I didn't really know what the rules were with the Masons, uh, but they, they let me in. And uh, so I'm- You really did get lucky then if you just showed up and they let you in. Yeah, I know. I, I, yeah, and I, 
and they let me look at the minutes, the minutes of the meetings of these slave traders as well. And uh, that was an unusual, I mean, you can prepare for going to Cuba in some ways and knowing that you're going to read Spanish, but I was not prepared for these minute books, which had all these symbols and you know, <laughs> I didn't know what I was looking at um, for the first little bit. So it was an experience. 